Good evening, viewers. Welcome to one again a show with GeoParsi. GeoParsi started as a community program for the Parsis under the Ministry of Minority Affairs. GeoParsi became a universal program for creating a work life balance. Like the Parsis, the world today faces issues of globalization. We all need our voices to be heard in the seemingly uncaring silence. We need advice on relationships, loneliness, health and well-being, and above all, psychological, practical and moral support. The online platform that we are offering causes everything from children to culture. As we plan, we look forward to your participation and suggestions. We are all together in this new world. Let us become a global family with trained professionals and experienced individuals online with us to create, help create an online family together. We have reached another Friday forum and we are looking to get back in touch with nature. Many of us have found a comfort in small things like a bird song on a quiet, street, clearer skies that most of us can remember. Now, wouldn't we like to have that even when we get back to work? World Environment Day was celebrated on June 5th. This year, the theme was on Time for Nature, which appropriately focuses on the important role that our natural environment plays in our lives. While we appreciate the beauty of nature, an understanding of the various species that constitute our natural habitat will enable us to better understand and thereby enjoy the sounds and sounds of nature in any part of the world. Today, we welcome Mrs. Avi Sabawal, who is a management consultant by profession, but a natural enthusiast by passion. Welcome, Avi. Over to you. Well, thank you very much, Shamla, for that nice introduction. Um, good evening, everybody, and to those of you who are watching from different time zones. Good morning and good afternoon. So today we are going to talk a little bit about nature and how we connect. All of us have a love for nature. Maybe it's a little hidden love. But nevertheless, it makes a lot of difference when we actually go out into natural surroundings, we see greenery, we see beautiful natural surroundings. It makes a lot of difference to our feeling, to the ambience. So today we are going to dive a little deeper into um, nature and try to understand it a little more. I'm sure that in the last two months, which have been very challenging, many gone through different phases and different challenges in our lives where we have faced lockdowns, we have faced the pandemic. But there's also one area perhaps where we have noticed something and that is nature has come alive. We are we have spring here in the northern hemisphere. We started with spring in March and spring is the time when the birds start chirping more. There's, it's the mating season. We also have the trees blooming, the flowering season. So there's a lot of changes taking place out here in nature. And therefore, perhaps you have all noticed something. And I would like you to share on the chat box, what exactly have you noticed about your natural surroundings, or if you have noticed. So let's look a little bit uh, further. Well, we recently, and that is exactly two weeks back, we celebrated World Environment Day. And this year, the 2020 theme was titled Time for Nature. And very appropriately, because today, we cannot live without our natural surroundings. The food we eat, the water we drink, the air we breathe, and even uh, the treatment, sometimes the healing that we get, is all from nature. Nature has great powers. And it can really, uh, you know, it's really sustaining us. The natural environment. So really speaking, our sensitivity to nature and what is going on around us will help us to become better observers, to appreciate what's around us, 
while we say, yes, I love greenery, I love nature, but really trying to appreciate the intricacies of it and trying to respect and, of course, conserve in the right way. That is very important for us. When we say, I'd like, I'd like to conserve and I want to uh, plant some trees, but understanding which uh, trees are appropriate for your environment, for your soil, and for your uh, climatic conditions is very, very important. So we were talking about being creative, music, literature, that is both poetry and prose, the arts, they have all been inspired by the, uh, have inspired our creativity. Many of the beautiful designs have come from nature. People have been sketching long before we had the fancy cameras. People have been sketching, making drawings. So there's a lot of inspiration. Today, the colors that we have are also inspired by nature, the natural colors. So there's a lot, there's lot that uh, you know we can learn. And of course, it's a great time to bond with family and friends. Only make sure that they share your passion too, to a greater or a lesser extent. Let's talk a little bit about the ecological system called the ecosystem services. What does nature really give us? An ecological is the interaction of various species with the environment. So it gives us provisional, it's provisional. That is, it gives us food, it gives us uh, water, regulates. There, there are many species today which actually regulate uh, you know, the proliferation of certain other species. For instance, today, the owls, where uh, a lot, there's a lot of, uh, you know, uh, shall we say, ideas about witchcraft, etc., which are incorrect. But actually, today, it's the owls and the nocturnal creatures who are controlling the rat and the rodent population. Otherwise, it would have just overflowed and invaded our planet. The maintenance. Now, if you see this photograph here, this is the photograph of a spot built pelican taken in Bangalore. So, anyone from Bangalore, so just 80 kilometers from this place called the Wings of Okre Belur. Okre stands for bird, and Belur is village. And this is a, a very eco friendly village because they welcome these birds, uh, the spot built pelican and the uh, painted stock. And they come and they nest in the trees. And it's a very interactive and a very communal, you know, it's a harmonious relationship between man and uh, the bird because they feed them with fish and other items. And at the same time, the bird droppings helps to fertilize their fields. It's a rice growing area. So their fields get fertilized. So there's a lot of maintenance work. If you see the recycling that takes place in nature is because it helps to maintain the whole ecosystem the fertility of the soil, the air, the trees that give us oxygen. So a lot of maintenance work is done. And of course, it gives us the aesthetic and the spiritual aspect of it and also promotes a lot of economic activity. When we say that, oh, uh, you know, nature and uh, ecology and economy are, uh, say, on opposites, it's not so. Economic activity can be promoted by good ecology. The example, of course, is ecotourism. If you see our own Bharatpur, Bharatpur, the economy of Bharatpur thrives on uh, bird tourism. So it's a great uh, opportunity for local people also to economically thrive on ecology if it's managed, of course, in the right way. So it shouldn't be that we've forgotten eco and only tourism, but ecotourism, that is promoting tourism in a very ecological and eco-friendly way. So we are going to look mainly at India and India being a tropical country, but it has a lot of diversity in terms of the habitat. If you see, we have the cold desert and the hot desert. Uh, we have the semi-arid region. We have the Himalayan region and the Northeast. And we, we have the Western parts. We have the Deccan uh, plateau. We have the Gangetic plains, and of course, a very long coastline. So all this promotes a lot of diversity in terms of the flora, that is the plant life, fauna, that is the animal life. So together, this forms the biological diversity or the biodiversity. And if you look at the next slide, uh, India has two of the 34 biodiversity hotspots in the world. You'll see the markings in red. So one 
hotspot is the Western Ghats, the Sayadris and the Malabar region, the Western Ghats, and the other is Northeast India. Reservoirs of biodiversity, and because they hold a lot of species which are very endemic to the region, by endemicity it means that a species which is found only in a restricted area and not found anywhere in the world or in any other part of the region. That is called endemicity. So you will see the red that we have two of the 34 species, and a lot of it is concentrated. A lot of these biodiversity hotspots are concentrated in the tropics because uh, the climatic condition does give rise to a lot of biodiversity. So, going on, let's look at India. We both uh, the Asiatic lion, the only population of Asiatic lion in the deer forest. We have the Asiatic wild ass, which is uh, in the run of Kutch, and we also have the Tibet wild ass which is uh, in, uh, Ladakh. Then we have the Indian one-horned rhinoceros in areas like Kaziranga, Pobitra, and Assam. We have the Royal Bengal tiger, whom we are going to meet in a few seconds now, and a large number of endemic birds and butterflies and a lot of smaller species. So now we are going to uh, have a date with a very handsome young guy. He's still a cub, but uh, growing very well. Uh, so we're going to have a look at him, a small video clip which I have taken in Rantabur. Okay, you hear know the disturbance of the teeth. Very often in these areas, there's a lot of disturbance, human disturbance also. But watch uh, his antique. And he's now trying to behave like an adult. He is marking, he's marking his pen. That is a very typical habit of a uh, cat. But they mark their scent to tell others that, okay, this is my territory, don't you dare come in. And he's trying to explore. He's still a kid after all. So he wants to explore. And very often when you travel into wildlife areas, you will find that some of the trees have floor markings. This is also very typical of some of the, uh, the big cats. This is a behavior of a big cat where this is also an indication that this is my territory. So if you are my rival, you better watch out. Either kill me or stay away. That's the message. And unfortunately, uh, sometimes in our desire to watch the tiger, we concentrate only on tiger tourism. You know, let us also enjoy the forest. So we go back to the presentation. So very often we focus a great deal on tiger tourism, but there's no, a lot more to see when we go out into the natural environment. And depending on what kind of uh, niche we are really looking at, whether it is land or it is trees, that is the ground, the terrestrial or water or aerial, very often many of the species that we see, plant and animal life, will uh, depend on the kind of niche that we are looking at. So some species will only be on the ground, even some birds will only be on the ground, so they are terrestrial birds. Some will only be in the canopy of the trees. Some will be mainly water birds, the easiest to see. And of course, some like the swifts will be usually flying. So let's look at some of the habitats. Now I'm taking the grasslands because they are most misunderstood habitats. They're really not based and they are very vibrant ecosystems. And if you see that 75% of our senior, of our process, of our diet, like uh, rice, wheat, sugarcane, comes from the grasses. These are all grasses, so they're very vibrant ecosystems. And they also form a good gene bank uh, and genetic resource for the food security of the country. We are going to look at some of the wildlife, including the bird life, which is there, which will only thrive in a grassland. If you think you'll grow a forest and you'll do a forestation, you will kill these species. So we need different kinds of ha habitat. We need forests, we need grasslands, we need water bodies. Uh, we need deserts also, which is why we have so much of variety in our country. Well, this is uh, the red habitat. You will very often see in reeds near water bodies. It's a beautiful bird and it has unfortunately, you know, when you're beautiful, sometimes uh, you pay for it. 
like the unfortunate tiger and some of our very pretty species that beautiful sometimes can be a crime in wildlife because people want to poach it you want to possess it and this has also been created so this is the red avid avid taken near the, in the grass in the reeds very often we say okay cut down these reeds it's all jungly uh, you know grass hair but this actually gives a lot of life she's like if the reeds go or it's like the red avid avid with also this is another very interesting and the one that you see on the left is the great indian buster which thrives in grasslands so again uh, this is a photograph taken in the nalya grassland of kutch and it is critically endangered according to our own law the wildlife protection act of 1972 is schedule one uh, animal and any kind of poaching or killing can invite penalty a schedule one group has the highest priority of protection so that includes uh, the tiger the lion the elephant the rhinoceros um, and many other bird and even uh, plant species like the sandalwood tree so it, we right now gujarat has just four females the male has apparently crossed over across the border to pakistan so it is critically endangered probably we have nothing more than 100 to 200 birds right now and we are on the brink of losing this it's on the brink of extinction so it's critically endangered on the right you will see another species of the buster and that is the lesser florican seen mostly during the monsoon and this is the male and that's the only time you can see because he jumps up high to attract his female this is also a bird which is very very rare and you got to be really careful Uh, you may have to go into maybe some uh, fields or somewhere and be very careful and very patient to be able to see it. Uh, how can you not go to Assam and see the one-horned rhinoceros? This was also a very this is also uh, a critically endangered. In 1905, Lady Curzon went to Kaziranga and did not spot a single rhinoceros. And when she came back and she complained. efforts were made and this is an excellent example kaziranga is an excellent example of turnaround management in wildlife now a rhinoceros will not be in dense jungles it will be in tall elephant grass because it needs grass to feed on so once again the habitat plays a very important role in the kind of species that you will find some species are very common you will find them all over including our urban habitat and some species are very specific to a habitat so we need to understand the interaction between the environment and the species and this is another the black buck taken in tal chhapar again in scrubland or in grasslands the moment you have dense forests this species will not be able to thrive because it needs grassland and these are two adult males sparring just to show their strength to some females So yes there's a lot of stories you know behind the behavior of animals and how each animal the male tries to woo its lady love so if you want to go in further there's lots to learn and of course unlearn too well the thorn forest well, this is of course the example of a, a babul tree where uh, you see the nest of the baya weaver and you'll see the baya also they're very small up there they're trying to build the nest and here again it's an example of good quality so if the male first of all is not handsome enough and he cannot build a good uh, nest he won't get a wife so the structural engineering is done by the male and the interior designing finally is done by the female provided of course she selects the male she comes she inspects a half built uh, nest and if she likes it she just occupies it and then the mating process starts and they do the interior and are ready to breed again so there are a lot of interesting uh, you know stories behind uh, how uh, birds animals and plants interact with each other and of course this is another king of the jungle in the gir forest unlike the tiger which requires a little more forested area the lion uh, is more an animal of the savannas or of the open forest so it may need light wooded country or even in savannas very often if you go to africa you'll see 
the African lion in a savanna area, whereas our lions have a little bit more of woodiness. Uh, this is the Asiatic lion, and this is the only gene pool of the Asiatic lion in the whole world. So India is the only country which has both the lion and the tiger and the leopard and the one-horned rhinoceros and we had the cheetah which we drove to extinction in 1947. The last cheetah was killed in Bihar in, in Chhattisgarh in 1947, which is very unfortunate. The Supreme Court has recently given an order for reintroduction of cheetahs, but they would be the, uh, the African cheetahs, most likely. So uh, this species is called uh, Panthera leo persica because it's believed to have come from Persia. So those of you who are Bawajis out here, uh, well, they preceded our arrival from Persia on the lighter side. So this is an example of the Asiatic lion. And we really need to preserve it right now. As per the lion census, the count is not more than 600. And they are now going outside their territory. They are going as far as Umbrelli, even to the sea coast. So we really need to consider proper habitats for them where they can thrive. The deserts, somehow we feel that, okay, what's there to see in a desert? Now, this is the little run of Kutch, which has a little, a different habitat. It has a lot of, uh, you know, small shrubland and whatnot. And the greater run of Kutch, which is solely in Kutch, and is 9,000 uh, square kilometers, is absolute desert. But there are a lot of good desert species also. And this Asiatic wild ass, we call it an ass, but actually it is more related to the horses. It's an equus, so it's more related to the horses. Um, it's more only seen, and there are about 3,000 of them left now. They cannot be domesticated like the donkey. Uh, they are absolutely wild, and uh, they are usually in large packs. So if you see the background, there will be uh, this small scrubland, but no dense forest. It requires open country. So there are numerous species. In fact, it's much easier to see uh, birds in a desert or in an open scrubland rather than in a dense forest. So we have that hot desert, the Thar and the, uh, the run of Kutch, and we have the cold desert. The only country to have both the hot desert and the cold desert. This is Kadungla, 18,000 feet high, which is the, the highest motorable pass. And in Ladakh, these are some of the interesting species. On the right, you will see a horned lark, which merges very well with the environment. If you are not observant enough, you're likely to miss it. It's just a little uh, uh, bigger than the sparrow. And on the uh, left, we have the Himalayan marmot. Now, these are species which are very typical of that habitat. So this is something that you have, you probably see in your own backyard. How can we forget our own backyard? This is the uh, magpie robin, uh, a great songster, a great mimic also. This is the season, March onwards, spring, summer is when he's constantly calling. And this is the male. The female will be a little lighter gray. So you know it's the female. And that is where the concept of dimorphism comes in. Dimorphism means that you can distinguish there are two different appearances between the male and the female. So this is the male and he will be calling. So watch out for him if you hear a nice songster around your house, it's likely to be the India, the uh, magpie robin. Another very interesting species of light woodland, you can see him in gear, as well as in some of the light forests around the cities also. And this is the Tickles flycatcher. The flycatcher is a very large family and they are the ones who actually control a lot of the pests there are a lot of species which actually are controllers. Remember the regulators that we talked about? So controlling the pest species uh, is very important for the balance of nature to ensure that these species also thrive so that they also take care of some of the natural pesticides in our world. Well, uh, many of you have heard about uh, the UN um, Sustainable Development Goals which came about in 2015 and the goals are for 15 years so 2030 is when we will be again reviewing but goal number 14 talks about water it talks about life on land it talks about poverty it talks about education gender equality etc 
but this goal talks about uh, water, life in water. In our country, 96% of our rivers are forest fed. So that's the importance of the forest in our country. And they contribute the, uh, the water bodies. If you see a lot of life has come up, even human life and habitation has come up, uh, you know, on the shores of uh, water bodies. So it plays a very important role. Maybe you can stay without uh, food for a couple of days, but certainly water is a must have. It is estimated that by 2025, about 1.8 billion people will be living in countries with absolute water scarcity. Now, this is a very scary thought. So it's absolutely essential that the water bodies, the ponds, the lakes, the rivers, even the seas, the coastline needs to be really protected. So looking at the fresh water, where it helps to recharge groundwater uh, for human consumption, irrigation, the salinity of soil. When we try to dam a river, you will find downstream that there's been a lot of saline ingress. The example is of the Narmada, that at Bharuch, there's a lot of saline ingress because the Narmada has been dammed and the flow has been severely retarded. There's rich biodiversity, plants, mammals, in, including us, birds, fish, we depend a lot on water and water bodies for survival. So here's an example of the lesser flamingo taken right in the heart of the city of Porbandar. This is the uh, bird sanctuary in the heart of Porbandar city, which is, uh, has a good population of uh, water birds, including the flamingos. It's a beautiful sight. And this is taken in the evening, almost during sunset. This is taken in Chambal. Chambal, as we know, used to be decoy country, uh, Fulan Devi's country. But it has, uh, the Chambal River is a very rich source of uh, life. And this Kariel, Kariel uh, we have three uh, crocodiles in our country. The marsh crocodile, whom we see quite frequently uh, in the rivers and the ponds. Uh, uh, we call it the mugger. This is the Kariel, that is the snout crocodile because of the snout. And we have the estuarine or the saltwater crocodile, which is normally found in salt water in eastern India. So this is again a protected, they are protected species under Schedule 1, highly protected. And the Karyal population mostly depends on fishes. So don't worry, it won't eat you. But uh, it's, a, it's a beautiful sight to, uh, to uh, see as you boat along the Chambal River. Uh, let's look at the marine life. 30% of the marine habitats have been destroyed with all the plastics and the oil spill. And it, they, are, uh, they really harbor a lot of biodiversity. So here's a look at the Andaman Islands. We have a lot of islands off the coast of India, including Pirotan off the coast of Jamnagar, the Andamans, um, the Lakshadweep. So this is an example of the corals. Now corals have a very unique place in our ecosystem because they are considered the rainforest of the sea. They harbor a lot of life, a lot of, uh, you know, fish is spawned there. And unfortunately, the corals today, because of global warming, are getting bleached. So a lot of destruction is taking place. And uh, because of the oil spills and uh, global warming, because the sea absorbs a lot of heat, uh, we need to really uh, take care of our sea coast or coastal. This is again a schedule one animal, looks quite innocuous, but don't ever think of putting your finger inside because if you do, it will just clam up and you'll have to cut your finger off. Now I'm not trying to scare you, but this is the giant clam, again, a schedule one animal taken in Lakshadweep, in the Minikoi Islands of Lakshadweep. And now we go over to the Eastern part, the Sundarbans mangroves. Mangroves are another very important ecosystem which also harbor a lot of life, a lot of spawning of fish, prawns, etc., takes place in the mangroves. And they actually protect against the tsunamis. Where there has been good mangrove coverage, the effects of a tsunami have been that much less. So they act as a good buffer also. And sometimes when we, even in Bombay and many other areas where we talk of, uh, say, cutting down and building coastal roads, take a step back and think of what it's going to do to affect the ecosystem. Those of you living in Mumbai on the coastlines, 
can go and have a look at the uh, the mangroves, uh, you know, and they form a very interesting ecosystem. This is an example of a mangrove species, the water monitor lizard. We have a monitor lizard in the jungles, but this is a water monitor lizard taken again in Sundarbans. Oh yeah, uh, I can see some of you squirming out there. Uh, and say, oh gosh, now where did this come from? But you know that spiders are also natural controllers of the pests, including mosquitoes and flies. There's this old song which says, will you walk into my parlor, said the spider to the fly. And uh, if you, of course, uh, I don't recommend that you don't clean the cobwebs in your house. But when you do, you will also notice a lot of mosquitoes have been caught in it. So this is a natural controller. These are, uh, these are the signature spiders. You will see on top, beside each leg, you will see, uh, you know, a little curling, which looks like a signature, an unreadable signature, which is why they are a species of signature uh, spiders. And if you see the one on the right has a lot of banding, the one on the left does not. So sometimes you've got to observe very clearly. And these are good examples of, uh, I take macro photography with a macro lens. So you get these kind of perspectives especially during the monsoons. Look out now during the monsoons. There'll be a lot of life uh, coming out. Insects, spiders, uh, butterflies, which are butterflies are also insects, by the way. So there'll be a lot of life coming out and you'll get a different perspective. So if we say that all insects on Earth disappeared, uh, that would be the end of human beings. But if we disappeared, probably life would flourish. Now I'm not recommending that we should go extinct. But the fact is that today insects form 25% of the animal population on earth, uh, of the animal kingdom. So they have a very, very important role to play. Yes, there are a few pests also, but by and large, a lot of pollination, a lot of the ecosystem services are carried out by insects. So let's look at these tiny creatures. These, this is a macro shot, so they are bigger. The photos are bigger than what they are. They are hardly probably two centimeters. And these are damsel flies, which depend. The damsel flies and the dragon flies are near water bodies because they lay their eggs in a water body. So if there's no water body, you won't get these. And these are also natural controllers of many of the uh, pests, the insects, the, the smaller insects that we have. So this is a dragonfly, the long-legged marsh skimmer taken near a village pond. Of course, we all love butterflies because they're very colorful, but there's some very small butterflies who don't feed on uh, flowers. They instead feed on the sap. So some of them are uh, very tiny and you need a magnifying glass and you need a large uh, macro zoom lens, uh, a macro lens to take these kind of photographs. So uh, these are some of the beauties of the monsoon. And I particularly include it because this monsoon will be the time when nature will have a very different face from the greenery to the uh, to the insects which thrive on there. And this is the species that are taken in the Western Ghats, the cruiser. In case you have very smelly, dirty socks, be sure he's going to love you for it. So he'll come and sit on your socks because they draw a lot of salt from these kind of, uh, they, we always think of these beautiful butterflies as sucking nectar, but some of them actually sit on animal dung or on, uh, you know, excreta by, for taking the salt. So there's a lot of, this is their way of recycling. So you see nature has a lot of uh, systems for recycling also. Otherwise our whole ecosystem would be full of waste. So there's nothing like waste. In nature, there's zero waste because everything gets recycled. Now, I know you're going to say, now, why on earth did this fellow have to come? Now, this is my friend. And um, this is taken in Chola Ghats, which is on the border of uh, Goa, Karnataka, and Maharashtra, in a place called Wilderness, a very beautiful resort called Wilderness, right in the Mahdi Wildlife Sanctuary. And every time we went to our dining hall, we had to do salam to him. He is the Malabar Pit Viper an endemic species found only in the Western Ghats. So this is one example of the endemic species of the Western Ghats. More species of the Western Ghats 
you see the draco on the left which is a flying lizard taken in bondla sanctuary in goa and on the right is a banded lizard so lizards also are great controllers of insects because they consume large amounts of insects so there's a lot of controlling of one species of over the other again a species of the western ghats the fungoid frog not all frogs are dull like our toads some of them are very colorful and on the right you will see a tree frog the malabar gliding frog taken at night uh, with a torch light so you'll see it's the beautiful green but with red legs and uh, it um, these are species sometimes which you have to do a, a a night walk to really see these species again the largest moth in india taken in agombe on the woodwork this is the largest moth called the atlas moth and the scientific name is uh, uh, attica atlas attica it's one of the largest moths even in the world the nilgiris also part of the uh, western ghats the Him the nilgiri tar you'll see a himalayan tar but this is taken in auriculum which is uh, close to munar so this is also an endemic species of the western ghats and for those of you in mumbai pune satara a hop step and jump near the caste plateau will give you some beautiful uh, species of flower, flowering plants especially in september uh, this is the topi carvi which flowers every 12 years so i'd gone in 14 specially to photograph this species and this is a carpet of the topi carvi this is another very interesting species uh, called uh, the cancers or the cyanotis tuberosa a quick look at the west the uh, northeast india which is again the biodiversity hotspots uh, you'll see a very interesting moth in a box these are the poor are the more sober cousins of our butterflies on the left so that is an arabide moth taken at night uh, with a uh, light with a mercury lamp and on the right is a uh, red lacewing which is endemic to the to northeast taken in arunachal in namdafa wildlife sanctuary this is eagle nest eagle nest has one endemic species called bubun flyers this year which was discovered by raman atreya in 2005 or 6 and you don't get any resorts or anything on the left you will see these are our humble tents uh, with the bare necessities and on the right you will see a very interesting sunbird called the blue tail sunbird uh the green tail sunbird which is uh, seen in the himalayas but this photo has been taken in eagle nest and it's a good place to see so uh, this is a little brief about uh, the species i know that i'm running out of time so very quickly uh, a few little tips we must focus that first of all tourism is for wildlife we go and say that we want to see the tiger we go with target species please remember that uh, tourism should be for the benefit of wildlife and not the reverse so it's not that you know hordes of tourists go and we demand to see the tiger because seeing a tiger in the wild is all a matter of chance it depends whether the, it's very likely the tiger has seen us and has not come out but there's lots to see so let us ensure especially photographers that the interest of wildlife comes first no chasing of wildlife no harassment of uh, wildlife uh, timeliness when you're going out to nature is very important if you go out early morning sacrifice a little of your sleep uh, you are likely to see a lot more because time and tide and i say tide also so it's a common phrase but very often high tide low tide also depends on whether you can really go out and see the marine life so remember you have to go according to time and tide very often there will be basic or no facilities as the previous slide shows you may have to stay in bare tents uh, be a good role model for other visitors because other visitors are misbehaving try to be a good role model for them and also when we are out and we are supporting eco tourism it's a good idea to support local initiatives if there are home stays it's a good idea to support it because they promote local uh, the local economy and we are promoting the local economy and the ngos so some quick do's and don'ts 
uh, before you go out into nature, do some preparation about the place. You can do a lot of downloading about checklists, etc. Invest in, before you invest in fancy cameras, mm -hmm. it's a good idea to invest in binoculars, which are cheaper, and a humble magnifying glass, especially for the monsoons and for small insects and flowers. Please follow and know the customs, rules, and the environment conditions, especially the, uh, the climate, the weather, etc., the customs, rules, etc. Always be alert about what's going on. Uh, have a good guide with you. You're, it's very important that you invest in a good guide and also in good guidebooks. Uh, please ensure appropriate clothing. It should not be bright colors. You are not there to show yourself. We go to see, not be seen. Uh, avoid carry your personal items. Don't forget any of them. Please make sure that you heed health warning, warning and make sure that you move the, slowly, not in a journey movement or don't try to run after an animal or try to run around. I've seen a lot of photographers in their desperation to catch that photo for Facebook, keep chasing animals. And please don't go with any kind of expectations because uh, you might come back disappointed, but definitely pack in lots of enthusiasm and you'll come back with something new and unexpected. Do not, of course, litter the place, uh, whatever your refuse is or your uh, rubbish is, keep a plastic bag hang, uh, handy. No harassing their animals and do not feed them. They are wild. So please let them be wild. Do not try to approach animals head on. Remember, an animal response will be either fight or flight. So it can either attack you or it can just fly away or run away and you lose your photograph. Uh, avoid any kind of music or chattering sound to a minimum, only what is required. Do not carry your valuables. And of course, do not use flash or lighting because uh, it can disturb the animal. And many wildlife sanctuaries have a uh, demand not to do it. If you see, of course, you will question my night photography, but that has been used very carefully uh, and with a very short uh, uh, you know, time span. Uh, do not try to take, touch or taste anything. It can be poisonous and of course, do not try to possess everything like feathers, etc. Because those feathers are used by other species, birds, to build their nests. So we are depriving the environment of something. Um, again, not single species focus. Oh, I want to see the tiger or I want to see a leopard or no, you may not see it. Or even a particular bird species. I'm, I've come all the way uh, to see the species. You cannot focus on a single species. Just enjoy the environment as it is. And overall, remember, this is not a zoo. So you will not get any guaranteed sightings. However good a guide you may have, he cannot guarantee sighting. Yes, you might tip him if you have seen a tiger or your favorite species. And he does his best. He will do his best to show you through pug marks and other indications. But even he cannot guarantee. So no, this is definitely not a clue. So once again, to pack in lots of enthusiasm, but leave your expectations behind. So uh, I would like to thank Geo Parsi uh, for arranging this uh, program and I, I hope all of you enjoyed it very much. Thank you all of you for being part of this. And thank you, Dr. Shaila Kama, Shamla Anand, and uh, our uh, person who has been taking care of the technicalities sitting in Spain, in Barcelona. Matab, thanks for all the patience with me over these last few days and the entire team. Uh, we now get on the questions. My request to you is that uh, the question should be focused on wildlife. As I said, we are not looking at domestic animals or at uh, cultivated. Uh, so let's focus maybe your question on wildlife. And where there's a little uh, thought that I have, the improvement of uh, lifestyles and well-being is depend greatly on preserving natural resources and ecosystems. If you go to the sustainable development goals, there are three aspects, that is economic development, social inclusiveness, and environmental concerns. So to promote the social inclusiveness and ensure that the uh, economy and economic development is for all, preserving our environment is of utmost importance. So thank you all very much.
And now we open Thank you, Abhi. Thank you so much for this fantastic presentation. Uh, we are left panting for more, actually. Uh, you we just came down. Yes, we would love to have more. For, but for the time being, there are a few questions that I would like to bring up to you. Yes. And uh, one of the main ones is that it was fantastic photography. Really good. And uh, our viewers would love to know what kind of a camera you're using. If uh, you will be uh, good enough to share. I mean, you, I know we know the lens that you chose, but I'm sure you change your lens according to the species that you're shooting. So, um, okay, tell us. Oh, yes, yeah. yeah, this is a, on the, just on the lighter side, I would like to add very many people say, oh, you take good photographs because you have a good camera. So my answer is that, okay, if you're a good cook, I'm sure you have a good pressure cooker. <laughs> So a lot of them also on the perspective. Uh, so to share with you, and I'm not trying to pat myself on the back, but uh, there's a lot of patience which goes in into getting the right shot. Let me assure you that with a very good camera, I've taken some lousy shots. So it's all about, uh, you know, the time of the day you are in, the luck that you have, uh, the technique that you use, the composition. So my camera right now, uh, is a uh, 70, Canon 77D. Uh, the lens that I have, uh, let me now reel off. Uh, okay. Uh, I recently, my latest uh, toy is a uh, wide angle 10 by 18. That's an ultra wide angle because I like to take landscape shots also. Then I have a 50mm prime for portrait shots, which I hardly use. But then everyone says, uh, you know, photographer must have it in the bag. So there I went and invested in it. And I use it sometimes it gives, because being a prime lens gives me very good uh, shots. Uh, then I have the, the kit lens, which came with the camera. That is an 18 by 135, which takes care of most of your uh, photography, the regular uh, photos, including trees, etc. I also use my 10 by 18 for uh, trees and landscapes. Uh, then with my old camera, I got a 55 by 250, which has no value now in the market. So I still, and I use that sometimes for mammal photography. If the mammal is old enough, I use that for mammal. Uh, so that's a very old one. Uh, then I uh, acquired another favorite prime lens, and that is a 100 mm macro lens, which I use for insects, small flowers, even droplets. Today, if you want to, it's a great idea when the rain has fallen, you know, and there are droplets, to take a macro photograph, you'll get some very interesting perspectives because that droplet acts as a magnifying lens. Okay, so that gives you a little creativity also in your shot. So 100 mm, I pack up my other lens and now I have my 100 mm on. And finally, for the birds, I have one uh, massive bazooka, uh, which is a, a rather old 150 500 Sigma there. It is a little obsolete now, but it does beautifully for me. And all my bird photographs have been taken with, uh, with that lens. So now this is a rather longish uh, uh, sort of list. But don't get overwhelmed. I would like to recommend for those of you who are not very technically and don't want to bother with the technical. I would suggest go for a DSLR. Go for a bridge camera, which gives you the functions of a DSLR and doesn't give you the bother of changing your lens. And you get a macro function on it also. And there are some lenses which have, uh, some cameras which have come out, which have even more zooming than say what a DSLR would have. Otherwise you would have to invest in a massive 1100 mm uh, lens. And believe me, carrying that lens my bags near the deadline of seven days. So if you are not technically oriented and you don't love that feel of that DSLR camera, but want something functional, I would recommend a bridge camera. Thank you so much. Lots to remember. Uh, there's a question here by uh, Devika Mitra, who says that she uh, that uh, been reading about the process of uh, artificial coral planting. Yes. and production successful in some countries. Yes. Uh, are there any measures that might exist in India regarding the same? 
Well, you know, this kind of these artificial uh, experiments still need a lot of research. That yes, uh, it looks very promising. And uh, well, I hope we can regenerate some of our lost corals because we have lost a lot of corals here as well as even in Australia and you know many other countries which uh, have large uh, you know, number of corals. So hopefully, this should be uh, this may answer some of our uh, need for regenerating of corals. But right now, that needs a little bit more of research to see how much. And it should not be that we uh, bring in species into an area which are alien. That's another very big area that sometimes in our enthusiasm, we bring in exotic species. Okay, so uh, we have to be very careful about what species, including planting of trees. This tree plantation, especially during World Environment Day, everybody is very enthused. But in the result that sometimes they plant exotic species, which are not good for our environment. The example is of course the eucalyptus. It should not be in our environment. So we need to be very careful about understanding environmental and habitat uh, areas and then introducing a species. But we need to generate a lost species or a uh, species on the brink of extinction. So take it with a pinch of salt. Right. But right, you have spoken so much about the environment around us. But when, uh, like on a regular day, when everybody is busy and uh, with the uh, resources that we have at hand, but don't realize that we will soon run out of water and other natural resources. So what suggestions do you have for maintaining the equilibrium, for maintaining this? You know, one of the things I've noticed, uh, many of our cities have water bodies. Today in Delhi, we have the Yamuna, and uh, I mean it is becoming a rubbish dump. Here in Baroda, we have the Vishwamitri, which was a perennial river, which has now become just an annual river, which overflows. Otherwise, it's like a little nala. And if you think, uh, you know, we as citizens, whilst we blame the government, we as citizens also need to take responsibility to see that we don't go and dump our rubbish there. Our rubbish has to be. Uh, done in such a way that if we can recycle it, for instance, composting, etc., let's do that. Our plastic waste also needs to be disposed of in a responsible way. Another is the construction waste, which invariably truck roads go and get dumped because it's a water body, it's open land, so it, uh, you know, mera baap ka kya jata hai attitude. I think we, we as citizens need to be careful. And another area which we also need. Uh, to uh, you know, propagate with our policy makers is avoid any kind of uh, you know these uh, these river banks etc. Let's keep the natural biodiversity of the uh, water body, building of roads, uh, planting exotic trees, and then having a sort of uh, 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 concretization of the banks. Where let's keep it because even those banks which have a natural habitat harbor a good variety of insects, which in turn attracts the birds. Many birds will come to feed on those insects. And when we concretize it, we are losing that habitat. You know, we are exterminating certain species. So we need to act in a responsible way. We sometimes think of our own convenience. But they step back and take a look and see what's happening without that concrete jungle around us. And also, uh, especially during the monsoon, try to keep some space which is open rather than having full paving so that water goes down and it recharges our groundwater. Today, we are sucking out a lot of groundwater also. Uh, besides the surface water, we are sucking out a lot of groundwater too. And we need to uh, see that we have some water recharging systems, water harvesting systems, especially during the monsoon. Otherwise, a lot of it runs off and runs into the nalas or the storm water drains and goes out into the sea. But if we can harness this fresh water uh, and ensure that the lakes uh, and the rivers do not have concrete banks, it will recharge the groundwater for us too. So uh, these are the natural ecosystems that nature has given us. Let's try to preserve it. Right. And typically this lockdown has introduced us to a lot of things in nature. 
So, uh, especially the birds and all, like when you first started, you said about the birds chirping. Uh, what can we do to keep this sustainable, keep it as a good thing which we can hear all year round, lockdown or no lockdown? That's a, that's a very relevant question, Shamla. Um, you know, very often we try to clear uh, some of the shrubs that are also with grow. Now, in our quest for, okay, we plant trees and we planted so many trees and our photo comes in the newspapers and on TV. Uh, well, I'm not, I'm not uh, you know, downgrading that. But we also remember that a good habitat has a good mixture of plant life. So, uh, depending on what the environment conditions are, what is the habitat, plant indigenous plants, whether it is trees or it is secondary growth, so sometimes the grass is also a shrub, a wild shrub which has grown. You mentioned something about butterflies and moths. Can you repeat that, please? Yes. Uh, you know, butterflies and moths, uh, as I was saying, they belong to the same order called Lepidotera. Now, I don't want to get too much into zoology, but yeah. Lepidotera is an order of insects. And insects are any species which has six legs and two pairs of wings. So it is called the hexapoda, that is the six-legged uh, creatures. Now spiders are eight-legged, so they don't come under, but they're closely related. Uh, these are the lepidotera. Now terra stands for, is the Latin for wings, and lepido is scales. So they are, if you touch a, a moth or a, a butterfly, they have a little scaly net which comes off on your hand. Now please don't touch them because you're harassing them, but, uh, uh, you know, they are very closely related also. And uh, for every species of butterflies, we have 10 species of moths in the world. In India, we have 1,500 species of butterflies and 15,000 species of moths. That's the kind of variety that India has. The various, including uh, reptiles, amphibians, we have about 10% of the uh, global population of mammals. We have a higher percentage of uh, reptiles and amphibians because we have a lot of tropical areas. Uh, we have about 12 to 13 percent of the bird species discovered so far. So that's a large reservoir of biodiversity in our country. So whilst we go wandering and say, oh, we had a foreign trip, and I encourage you all to travel abroad, uh, step back for every foreign trip, please take couple of trips in our own country and you'll discover India like never before. Thank Including of course the culture and the heritage and the natural heritage. You'll see India which is wonderful in all its myriad hues. And you did show us a glimpse of it. So yes. yes. And I focus particularly on India because I think we have not appreciated it's that uh, famous phrase, you know, Dal uh, Yes. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much, Avi. It was really, really wonderful. Uh, we are very sorry for the glitches that we had, some things that we cannot control beyond our control, but nature, yes, is within our control, right? So we would look forward to having you over again. God willing, people willing, yes. And uh, to the viewers, please go visit our website, Instagram, follow us on Facebook and learn how we can help you. And also please send in your suggestions. Thank you so much. Have a good evening. Stay safe.